Today on Studio One, learn about the push for bike trails as more people trade in the steering wheel for handlebars. Also, we'll share unusual and sometimes weird rituals that baseball players swear by. And one man searches the country to find and restore pieces of gambling's past. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Hello everyone and welcome to Studio One. I'm Monty Cashel. And I'm Katie Fletcher. Well, it's hard to surf through the channels and not land on a reality television show today. Yeah, I mean, you're flipping through the channels and you see people just going about their everyday lives. And but that makes a TV show now. Yeah, definitely, but probably with a little more drama. Right, exactly, and that's the key, right? The, the storyline. And uh, MTV actually has a, sh has a show, a reality show called Made, and we get to talk to one of the contestants that was on the show. The reality show focused on her and someone else. And uh, we get to ask her if it's really reality, which is the big question always, of course. Right. Yeah. That's coming up. Also on the show, gas prices cause many people to put the bike pedal to the metal. Find out how cyclists are pushing for more bike trails. And investigations require careful research and examination. Later we will meet two reporters who discovered corruption that led to the re-examination of some Philadelphia drug cases. Before we get to all of that, here's today's news with Stephanie Shire. Thanks, Monty and Katie. Congressman Bobby Rush gave a speech on Trayvon Martin to the House of Representatives on Wednesday. The Illinois Democrat told members of the House that racial profiling has to stop. During his speech, the congressman pulled off his jacket to reveal a gray hoodie and put on sunglasses. He was declared out of order for violating the House dress code and was led away by a clerk. Several African American lawmakers have appealed to the House floor to call for an arrest in the Martin case. Pope Benedict XVI traveled to Cuba this week after visiting Mexico, where he had denounced the violence-plagued drug war. Thousands gathered in the Havana's Revolution Plaza for Mass to hear the Pope's sermon. The Pope praised the emergence of religious freedom in Cuba. However, he did not touch on political freedoms. The Pope met with President Raul Castro and his brother, former President Fidel Castro, during his visit. As we race to accomplish everything in our busy schedules, more young people are turning to energy drinks. But these canned concoctions are creating the opposite effect. A new Mintel survey says sales of energy drink products have more than doubled in the past five years. 51% of college students surveyed regularly consumed more than one energy drink per month. However, absorbing stimulants such as sugar and caffeine can have negative effects on the body. One of the side effects of caffeine is that it serves as a diuretic. And when you have a diuretic, you're flushing the system of its fluids. And when you get dehydrated, a lot of students or young users uh, get really, really tired, lethargic and zombie-like uh, as a direct effect of the, the caffeine working on their system. White also says mega doses of water will help replenish your system. Also, eating crunchy foods like apples, celery, and almonds will aid in increasing alertness. If you're planning your summer vacation, you may want to rethink your transportation. With fuel costs on the rise, finding a reasonable airfare is soon becoming a thing of the past. Crude oil is up to $145 a barrel. Officials say that price of oil will continue to go up over the summer months. Because of this, travelers can expect ticket prices to climb as well. Industry analysts say people need to adjust their expectations and what they consider to be a low fare. So far this year, some airlines say they will not earn a profit from the first three months because of the fuel costs. As many people consider driving instead of flying for long trips, shorter commutes are a different story. More bikers are evading the gas prices and many communities are trying to accommodate them. For several years, he has ridden to work in a different way than the average Joe. For Joe Vasek, it's not only about being healthy and saving money. I ride my bike to work every day because it's fun. I thoroughly enjoy it. Some people think I do it for the exercise and some people think I do it because it's uh, good for the environment, but really my motivation is it's fun. With only one car in the family, he started biking to work every day and he has stuck with it ever since. For bikers like Joe, it is also important that the trails have a certain standard. They um, review what we already have, maybe look at some traffic patterns, what are the users doing. They also ask for public input. Um, that's when they will make suggestions for new trail connections or new pieces of trail. Kim says the only critique of the bike trail she has had is that the community wants more of them, and the city is not alone. 
with gas prices at $4 a gallon for one-third of the U.S. More communities are pushing for bike trails. Just looking at it, roughly speaking, I think I probably save about $2,000 a year. The League of American Bicyclists say the last time gas prices were this high in 2008, bicycle ridership rose. As the number of people on bikes rises, so does the need for bike paths. A great opportunity for people to get out and not only save money on gas, but also get that much needed exercise, that time outside. As the motorists drive to the pumps, the average Joe will pump it up with his pedals. I'm Cecilia Engseth. Reporting for Studio One. The U.S. Senate recently passed a long-term transportation bill which bike advocates celebrated. It designates 2% of federal transportation funding to go toward bicycle and pedestrian programs, which includes city bike paths. And that's the news for now. Monty and Katie? Thanks a lot, Stephanie. It's hard for me to think of a downside to more people biking. And definitely, you get a workout while saving the environment. Yeah, exactly. Let's go to Kellen Peters now with the weather news. He's going to talk about how all around we've been experiencing drier conditions than normal. Thank you, Monty and Katie. You know, it really has all throughout the entire country. Now, if you take a look at our weather graphic, at this time of the year, this is a flood risk all the way from the start of April to the end of June. And if you're looking specifically at, at parts of North Dakota and Minnesota right up here, Usually this is flood season, you would be start getting ready or sandbagging. However, this really isn't the case is because of the lack of snowfall that we experienced over the winter months. Now, really the only areas that are going to be seeing any flooding will be around the Ohio River area with that states including Ohio and Illinois. Other than that, the flooding is really only going to occur because of precipitation. Now this is actually the first time in four years that there has not been a single area that has had a high risk of flooding. Actually, Minnesota and North Dakota are still technically in a drought, and it's predicted by some meteorologists that it's going to need two to five inches of rainfall this month to get over a drought. Now, a drought is classified under two things, the precipitation over time. So with a lack of it, that is where you start going into something called a drought. Now, take a look at this map. This is a drought outlook for the entire United States. You can see Minnesota and North Dakota, conditions are likely to improve over the past two weeks. We have been seeing some rainfall, which has been helping these conditions. However, the southwestern part of the United States has been quite a different story. In fact, is the conditions are predicted to get a lot worse. Now, the recipes down there really have not been helping them out right now. With with actually over uh, down in California, they actually have to battle Santa Ana winds. And with that, that's the perfect recipe for, for forest fires. And in that area too, they've had a lot of reservoirs building up water. And with that, um, with the conditions of being very dry, uh, the water levels are actually, uh, actually, they're a little worried about. Now our outlook for the rest of, for the next week is it's still very dry in the area that really is not wanting this to happen right now. And over other parts out east in the, in the south, southeastern part of the United States, still very, it's actually predicted not to see any rain at all. Now temperature wise, it's, it's actually in the central part of the United States, it's getting a little better actually, is they're starting to see average temperatures in that area and actually in the um, Mountain area, it's above average temperatures. Now, we were talking about water earlier and the usage of it, and that brings us to our weather question of the week. It is, on average, how many gallons of water are used daily per household? Is it 180, 230, 350, or 460? Now, Monty and Katie, if you're not quite too sure, a little hint for you is an average shower, you use two gallons per minute. Wow, that's quite a bit. Thanks, Kellen. Thank you. And if you're a household that has teenagers, uh, maybe that a lot more. Yeah, maybe we'd get into the thousands or, or yeah, so. Those with the twenty minute right? showers that <laughs> exactly. we need. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, let's turn now to some sports highlights. It's always fun to watch those, and John Schaefer to lead lead us through those. Thanks, Monty and Katie. On March 18th, Brad Keselowski had the first tweet ever from Victory Lane. This is more proof of the popularity Twitter has in professional sports, but it's been received with mixed emotions at the college level. Collegiate athletes across the country may or may not have access to the social media all-star. Many times it is at the discretion of the coach. The University of South, South Carolina head coach Steve Spurrier banned the use of Twitter following misinformation leaking out from players. Players that are allowed to chirp from mobile devices or computers could be more closely monitored now more than ever. Yes, they are. 
We all have our tweet decks open uh, around the clock. And uh, we try to be vigilant because, again, that's 400 student athletes, and we need as many eyeballs on those accounts as we can. Some universities are using web services to monitor college athletes' social network accounts. The service alerts athletic staff and coaches of any issues before they become problems. It's now time for the Studio One Sports Trivia question. What team did Babe Ruth hit his first home run against? Just a small hint, he played for two of those teams. But we'll get to that later in the show, and that's the sports, Monty and Katie. Thanks, John. The classic tale of Snow White has some untold adventures. Julia Roberts plays the evil queen who gains control of Snow White's rightful throne. We'll preview the new movie, Mirror, Mirror. Also, controversial issues can be difficult to report on. Next, we'll meet two journalists who embrace this challenge. They uncovered corruption in a Philadelphia police drug squad. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences is meeting the challenge of future healthcare workforce shortages. The state's only medical school produces the highest percentage of graduates nationwide who choose family medicine. Advanced degrees are also offered in basic medical sciences like anatomy and health professions like physical therapy. Students learn and train throughout the state. In that way, we really are North Dakota. Make your choice the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. Accounting at the University of North Dakota is more than just numbers. It's about maintaining a history of high quality education and developing leaders in the accounting profession. While numbers stay the same, the UND accounting program continues to evolve. UND hosts one of the country's best accounting programs and now offers a master's degree in accountancy. Accounting at the University of North Dakota, numbers accelerated. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce guests, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. Help others live to their full potential. Improve clients' mental and physical well-being. Excel in one of the top healthcare careers of the future. Occupational therapy students at the University of North Dakota experience high quality education in small classes. You have to come to 45 degrees, okay. even in a normal motion pattern. Your healthcare career begins at the University of North Dakota. You're watching Studio One News, Weather, Sports, and Entertainment. Citizens rely on authorities to do their jobs ethically. It can be hard to hold authorities accountable for wrongful actions. Philadelphia news reporters and Pulitzer Prize winners Barbara Laker and Wendy Ruderman found corruption in a narcotic police squad. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So there's a lot of detail that goes into a, this award-winning story, um, you know, and it kind of you got first wind of it when an undercover in informant came to your office, you know, terrified for his life. This jump started the story for you? Absolutely, yeah. His name was uh, um, Mr. Martinez. He came in and he had this story that seemed really sort of almost wild and improbable, kind of like The Wire, if you've ever seen that show. But there was, um, there was something to his story. He was saying that he had been working with this undercover narcotics officer for about seven years and that this narcotics officer was renting a house to him. So, um, and we, we didn't realize this, but when what his job was was to make uh, drug buys. So he would knock on a door ask the people for drugs in the house and that would be the basis for the police to go in and get a search warrant for the house and the police department actually paid him 
which is normal. You get paid, it's sort of like a paid job. You get paid per house and you get paid if there's guns in the house extra. And so all the money he was making was going back to this narcotics officer for rent money. So. Okay, yeah. How, Barbara, how hard was it to pitch this kind of a story? It was difficult because um, Benny Martinez was a convicted drug dealer. So we're taking the word of a convicted drug dealer and the cop involved who he first talked about um, to us, Jeff Chuddock, was a decorated cop. So it wasn't easy at first, but our editor let us kind of go with it and check out his story because he was saying that the cop was fabricating evidence in some cases and lying on search warrants. So we had to check that out by tracking down all these drug dealers in really bad neighborhoods to see what they had to say. But we were we wanted to do it and we thought it was worth checking out and our editor gave us time to start with that process. Wendy, could you kind of give a description of, you know, the overall basis of the story? Uh, well, the story was, it, it unfolded in three sections. The first section was about fabricating evidence and lying on search warrants to get into people's homes um, and the financial arrangement between the informant and the police officer. And then the second segment that we rolled into was actually we had uncovered that this particular narcotic squad was literally looting and robbing mom and pop stores, little bodega stores on the corners where, you know, sort of like a corner convenience store in cities. Um, and they would go in and they would dismantle the surveillance cameras. And then they would take money, make sandwiches, slurp sodas, um, really just terrorize these um, shop owners. And this had been going on for a while and the shop owners had kept quiet about it um, until Barbara and I knocked on their door and began to talk to them about it. And we had convinced a whole bunch of shop owners to tell their story. Okay, and you keep mentioning shop owners. We actually have a video of um, when the police raided a certain shop and they actually took yeah. down the surveillance cameras. So we're going to show our viewers that now. Okay. There's one in the back one right there. These can, they can be viewed at home. Okay, we'll disconnect. So was this the big break in the story for you? It really was. The video in particular. Oh, go ahead, Barbara. Oh, I don't want to okay. cut you. <laughs> no, it was a big break because we had first written about um, merchants who said they had been raided by these cops, and they told us what had happened, that the cops came in and, and did what you just saw, where they cut the wires and then took money from the stores. But after that story ran, one merchant, Jose Duran, called Wendy and said, he spoke very little English, but what he could say was that he had a tape, and he had a backup tape of when his store was raided. And th this is what you see. He had an audio and visual of the cops coming in there, and you can hear and see what they did. And that tape that you just ran was because uh, they dismantled every single camera in the store. And so that was one of them that they, they pulled down the wire, and he took a kitchen knife from the deli, the store deli, to cut the camera wire. So no one could see. Um, there was no proof of what they did after that, yeah. or so they thought. Okay, I'm sure in reporting a big story like this, there's a lot of struggles. Wendy, what were some of those? Um, well, we got a lot of pushback from the police union. The police union in Philadelphia is very strong, and we happened to be running the story at a time, an unfortunate time, where there was a lot of violence in Philadelphia, and police officers, an inordinate amount, were being killed in the line of duty. So they really, we got a lot of threats. Um, the, the, the police put my home address on a chat site. There was a, a, a chat site run by police officers where they had put my address on there. And um, they would say they wished that we would get killed, and you know we would get hang-up calls. And it, there was um, there were some definitely dicey moments, yeah. And I think the other challenge of the story was really just knocking on doors. We knocked on hundreds of doors in neighborhoods, and we wore out our sneakers um, talking to people in the street and in some again some scary places. Yeah, and these are dangerous neighborhoods where I mean we heard gunfire. We heard. You know, one time we were out there and we heard the um, we heard gunfire far away, and then we heard this one guy. He was arguing with someone across the street, and he said um, he was going to go get his piece. So I turned to Wendy. I said, "We got to get out of here," <laughs> because we didn't know. We thought we could get caught in the crossfire. The people in the neighborhoods were great to us because we weren't threatening and we weren't intimidating, and we just wanted to hear what they had to say. And in fact, they looked out for us. But you, could, our fear was that somehow we get caught in the crossfire and we. We didn't want to get killed before we'd finished the story. <laughs> yeah, right. That'd be a bad thing. <laughs> um, how much of the story consumed your life? 
We, we worked a ton. I would say we worked 12 hour days routinely and we would leave at midnight a lot of times. It would be dark outside. And I always joke, my, I have little kids and my kids would say things to me like, oh, it was so nice having you visit when I would leave for work. Or they would <laughs> say like, they'd ask me if I was the babysitter, if I was home watching them. And I, I think they were just twisting the knife. You know, I hope <laughs> they weren't serious. <laughs> you know, Kind of balancing your family and work life, you know, what kept you moving forward? Barbara? We were obsessed with this story and we really believed in it. And we really believed that the people who had started talking to us really had no voice in the city. They were people who felt that they had no power. Like these bodega owners, they hadn't reported this to anyone until we found them. And we found 16 for the first story who would go on the record for us. And they were scared. They thought it was just the part of doing business in the city. This is what you had to pay. All right. Thank you, Barbara and Wendy, for coming on the show today. Such an incredible story. Oh, Thanks pleasure. so much for, having, Thanks us. for having, us. having us. Coming up, athletes do many things to prepare for the big game. Some rituals can be a bit strange. Find out about superstitions in baseball. Also, some people find enjoyment in preserving things of the past. We'll meet a man who restores and sells antique slot machines. Very fun. Studio One closed captioning is underwritten in part by Options, your disability information source. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. This is a place where innovation abounds. A place where dreams come true. A place where creativity is a way of life. A place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. Fairy tales illuminate ideas of magic, heroes, and true love. In the new movie Mirror Mirror, filmmakers attempt to bring a classic fairy tale to life in a new and creative way. When a beloved king dies, his merciless wife gains control of the kingdom and in turn his daughter, Snow White. When Snow captures the attention of a visiting prince, she is banished to the forest by the jealous queen. She soon befriends a group of bandit dwarves. When she learns about the queen's impending marriage to her beloved prince, Snow and the dwarves devise a plan to save him and the kingdom. And she's modernized in a way where in this story the princess almost saves the prince at the end instead of the prince saving the princess. So in that sense it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to play it. The director wanted to bring new color to the classic story. Producers pulled inspiration from films of the 30s and 40s when designing the sets. They say their goal was to make each one a separate work of art. The handcrafted gowns worn by both Snow and the Queen took about 20 minutes to put on. The film is rated PG and is set to hit theaters March 30th. Now it's time to look at the events happening in your area.
People find them fascinating, intriguing, and sometimes even beautiful. At the same time, they have a reputation of being an expensive form of entertainment. We've met a man who devoted the last 20 years of his life to fixing a piece of history. It has a reputation of stealing our pennies, nickels, and dimes. Slot machines haven't always been able to keep their friends over the years. Even so, people line up to form new friendships. Skip Larson felt sorry for the cast iron slots of yesterday. He opened them up and kept them spinning. Very functional, very smooth playing. Even though he seldom hears the never too familiar sound of rain, the friendship between the fixer and the one-armed bandit is evident. And everybody's been to Las Vegas or have heard about it and what goes on there. And they've all, uh, you know, seen one and wanted one. This handyman didn't only want one little bandit friend. Today, Skip owns more than 70 antique slot machines. And it is fun to have them in your home because, you know, if you have a party, you know, it's kind of a, a little masterpiece. They'll get over there and play. And when not hosting parties, the couple travels from Chicago to Las Vegas in search of more spinning little fruits. Sure, I understand. Everybody clicks something. And as long as the friendship with the entertaining little crook is there, Skip will make sure their reels keep on spinning. Dog am them for Studio One. It is legal to sell one antique slot machine a year without having a federal license. Skip told us many of the slot machines he sells makes their way to the Netherlands. There's a big market for collectors there. Coming up, March usually means floods, not fires. Find out what conditions result in a burn ban. That's story plus news, sports and weather in the next half hour of Studio One. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by NDAD, helping others to help themselves. If this tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. Help others live to their full potential. Improve clients' mental and physical well-being. Excel in one of the top healthcare careers of the future. Occupational therapy students at the University of North Dakota experience high quality education in small classes. You have to come to 45 degrees, okay. even in a normal motion pattern. Your health care career begins at the University of North Dakota. This is a place where innovation abounds, a place where dreams come true. A place where creativity is a way of life. A place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. Your future depends on this moment. Take the path that leads to your future. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Welcome back to Studio One. Thanks for joining us today. 
So everyone knows one, or maybe you even do it yourself, mm -hmm. but those people that decide to whip out their phone and talk in public. Yeah, I know. Some people just talk really loud. Yep, and people can't help but listen in. Mm -hmm. Well, there's actually a device out there that can jam cell phones, take yeah. away all the reception. I think they're illegal, but, but it is out there. Yes, yeah. they are illegal, but we thought it'd be interesting to go get your thoughts. And if you could jam a cell phone, where would you and why? Okay, I've got some interesting answers coming up for you. Also, in the next 30 minutes on Studio One, early spring temperatures have called for an early plant. Find out the risks that some farmers are taking. Also, sometimes music genres mix, mix. We'll meet a uh, cellist who interweaves Native American music with classical. And most people understand that reality TV is hardly reality anymore. Later a woman will share her experience of being in front of the camera for a popular TV show. But first, here's today's news with Stephanie Shire. Thanks Monty and Katie. Investigators are trying to determine what caused a pilot's freakout on March 27th on a routine flight. Captain Clayton Osborn from JetBlue was flying from New York to Las Vegas when his co-pilot noticed some erratic behavior. When Osborn got up to leave the cockpit, the co-pilot locked him out. This prompted a string of rants proclaiming there were terrorists on the plane. Passengers took action, some holding the pilot down until the flight could be diverted. Now authorities are saying Osborn could be facing up to 20 years in prison and a two $250,000 fine. Autism has become a growing issue in the U.S. The latest poll shows a 78% increase in the number of patients from the previous decade. Doctors are able to diagnose 90% of children at two years of age. But a new study is showing that many cases are being diagnosed too late. Treatment has been proven to be the most effective between the ages of two and three, especially with speech and communication. Saving lives one less cigarette at a time is the intention of many cities that go smoke-free. Research done at the University of North Dakota shows more hard evidence for the correlation between smoking bans and our health. Tobacco use is the major cause of top chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. It is also the number one cause of preventable deaths. A recent study by the School of Medicine and Health Sciences found that the incidence of heart attacks in the city of Grand Forks dropped by 24 0.1%. This was just four months after the city's smoking ban took effect. When we had uh, talked to the city council about this two years ago, at the time that the law was being drafted and put into effect, uh, we told them that we would try to find data uh, that would be worthwhile and show them that uh, this had been a good choice. 27 states have enacted statewide smoking bans in public places. Wet willies, swirlies, and pushing someone into a locker are all classic forms of bullying. These days, however, the mistreatment of one student to another expands far beyond the school grounds. Cyberbullying has become a real problem and many states have enacted laws to help. Currently, 48 states have anti-bullying laws in place. Now some states like Indiana, Kentucky, and New York, to name a few, want to strengthen those laws and add specific consequences for electronic harassment. Under proposed laws, anyone found guilty of cyberbullying could face a misdemeanor or even a felony charge. For many farmers, March still means winter, but with the mild temperature, spring fever is getting them in the field. Planting season usually begins about the third week in April, but for this farm in northwest Minnesota, it's already in full swing. April 7th was the earliest, so we're a good five to six weeks ahead of schedule right now. Spring wheat is the crop of choice, and the weather plays a huge factor. Depending on temperatures and precipitation, the wheat will emerge seven to ten days after planting. Then it will take anywhere from three to four months before it can be combined. Where some crops thrive in heat, that's not the story for wheat. Wheat is the cool, cool, cool crop, so it likes these type of temperatures, and, and uh, hopefully we'll get a better yield out of the wheat. But some risks may be high. Only once in the last century has the Midwest been able to avoid frost between mid-March and mid-April. Insurance, that was our first question we had last week when we were tossing around the idea of going, of planting. Uh, we called up our insurance agent and he said, there's an April 1st uh, planting date for spring wheat and, and the, uh, that only covers receiving costs. As long as the wheat plant makes it, if anything else happens to the crop besides the frost of planting too early, they will still be covered. Mike says he's excited about starting early, but has a bit of nervousness on his side. 
it still is a gamble, no doubt about it, but usually you, you can come out ahead when you get into the ground earlier. But Mike knows if you want to win big, you have to risk big. With photographer Devin Krinke, I'm Brittany Konop, reporting for Studio One. Mike says his company, R&B Growers, have a $12,000 risk right now by starting early, but he says they have risked much more in that past. And that's the news for now. Monty and Katie? Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Yeah, you, you think of agriculture and the risks that are taken like that. It's, uh, you know, right. it depends on the weather. It really does. And <laughs> speaking of weather, let's go to Kellen Peters now. He's going to talk about a storm that hit the West Coast. That's right, Monty and Katie. Uh, this past week, uh, the Orange County area actually faced a storm that swept through the area. In fact, it caused over an inch of rainfall, as you can see, tourists and residents are having a little difficulty shop shopping. And actually, rain was actually getting into their area. Uh, the shops and, and the storekeepers actually had to some sweep out some rain, so it was an annoyance. Now, uh, entertainment-wise, there was a NASCAR race there the past week, and that race was actually called early. Now, as for, there was very strong winds too as well. So actually some trees that are 125 feet tall were actually pushed over and blown down by the wind. Now taking a look exactly what happened with this storm. As you can see, this is, a, is an occluded front with a cold front in front of that. And with occluded fronts, it generally have a wide variety of weather ph phenomena that's going on. In this case, there's a lot of rain that was falling. And in LA itself, they actually had over a inch of rainfall in this area. Um, w in this area, they had actually over around over 6,000 people were left without power. Luckily, a third of those residents were able to get power later in the evening. Uh, Camarillo Airport actually recorded over an inch and three quarters of rain, which is, uh, was a 25-year-old record that was broken. Other parts in this area, Malibu, California, actually got up to three inches of rain. This actually forced a highway to close due to a rock slide actually forced some vehicles off the road. Now, while we are early this year with spring, it has caused a lot of hazardous weather. However, with the lack of some rain actually can create some hazards as well. In the spring, people are normally concerned with flooding, but this time of the year, it's fire that could cause problems. With little snow cover, things have been drying out rapidly. Burn bans are placed in order to prevent fires from breaking out. Somebody will report their neighbors burning some things. We'll go out and investigate. And if they are and they violate the burning ban, they will be cited into court. This year, burn bans have been issued across North Dakota and northern Minnesota. This is about a month earlier than normal, and Sheriff Rost says that the bans could last longer than usual. You know, we didn't get much snow. Uh, the snow cover's gone, and we've had very little precipitation since then. Wind is also a huge factor in issuing burn bans. Wind dries out the environment faster and can spread fires swiftly. With these factors, the tiniest spark can start an outbreak. You know, somebody flicks a cigarette out the window, uh, railroad cars go down, you know, uh, the line, and sparks come off the wheels or whatever, they ignite fires along the railroad. News media and forest signs will inform the public when bans are in place. Sheriff Ross says people should also keep watch. People just need to be alert. If there is a ban out and uh, they see a fire, let us know you know, so we can take action. Personal responsibility and prevention is the best action against fires. Now early, no, uh, excuse me, uh, most counties when there is a burn ban in place, that means no burning at all. That includes even a simple controlled fire. Now earlier in the show we were talking about water and usage and during a drought. Brings us back to our weather question of the week. It is on average, how many gallons of water are used daily per household? With the answer at 350 gallons of water. So Monty and Katie, so definitely enough to quench your thirst right there. <laughs> sure is, thanks Kellen. Thank you. Yeah. Well it's, uh, and I'm sure as the, the weather gets nicer, people get those above ground pools going. And yep, water in the lot lawn. A lot of water. All right, well let's turn again to sports and John Schaefer. Thanks Monty and Katie. Baseball has a history of superstitions, such as the Curse of the Bambino, which allowed Boston Red Sox fans to believe they would never win a World Series. But some players take superstitions on a more personal level. The game of baseball is a sport that is rich in history and in superstition. Players believe that a certain ritual may help the way that they play. I started chewing gum three years ago <laughs> and now it's to the point if I don't chew gum I feel like I'm not gonna do well. 
A study from Northwestern University says that to have a superstition in a game can lead to helping a player gain better control of his performance. Reed is not the only player on his team to feel this way. If I do well the day before I try to repeat everything I did the day before, before the game, like eat the same stuff, try to get the same off sleep, play the same video games. It is almost impossible to determine how a player will perform or if these rituals help. But regardless of the outcome, many players swear by them. A pre-game routine when I pitch, I e either drink a Starbucks Frappuccino or a Starbucks Double Shot. Some habits are normal, while others can be bizarre. But when a win or a loss is at stake, players will do anything to keep their heads in the game. Baseball is a really mental game. But the best thing is, is that if you not think about it, it's mental, but you don't try to overthink. Because when you overthink, you overanalyze, and you just do mistakes that you wouldn't normally do if you were feeling comfortable. Whether it's a silly rule from the past or a unique guideline created by a player, rituals are a staple in the game. With photographer Dog Amdam, I'm Jimmy Geffro reporting for Studio One. The curse of the Billy Goat superstition still lives for Chicago Cubs fans. It began when a fan's pet goat ran onto the field during a World Series game back in 1945. Now some fans claim because of that, the Chicago Cubs wouldn't play in a World Series game ever again, and they haven't. Now the answer to this week's Studio One Sports Trivia question, what team did Babe Ruth hit his first home run against? It was actually A, the New York Yankees in 1915 when he played for the Boston Red Sox. And that's the sports, Monty and Katie. Thanks a lot, John. People use cell phones everywhere. We wanted your thoughts on where you would like to interrupt a cell, cell phone conversation and why. Your answers are still to come. Also, melodies from the same musical genre all have a similar sound. We'll meet a woman who combines different sounds to create a unique musical performance. If this tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. Your future depends on this moment. Take the path that leads to your future. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce guests, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. You're watching Studio One from the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. Most people compartmentalize music. We'll talk to a musician who likes the mixture of sounds. The beating of the drum fills the air as skilled fingers strum out one of Bach's creations. It is a blend of sounds like no other. And for cellist Don Avery, it is the combination of her musical training and heritage. To have those two worlds blend together to me is like having the best of two worlds. Don Avery is a professionally trained cellist who has toured worldwide. It was during her travels that she was inspired to learn the music of her people. After about 10 years of touring, 
I started studying and going back to my people to learn my own music. So she began integrating the sounds of her Mohawk heritage into classical songs. The cross-pollination of genres created an outlet for expressing two cultures. There is something about how they can grow together. Because if you're cross-pollinating, you're actually going to grow together and create something new that can be very beautiful. Avery's performance was part of a series at the North Dakota Museum of Art dedicated to the combination of musical sounds. Cross-pollination is, you know, the bees do it, everybody, the flowers do it, but it's where you bring one tradition into another and they change both. Don says the change isn't about taking away from either sound. I really feel like they don't have to merge and be perfectly together because that might be forcing something. But they really can coexist of themselves. A combination of sound and tradition, a blend of new and old, Don Avery's music represents the perfect balance between two worlds. This is Katie Mullally reporting for Studio One. Don started playing the cello at the late age of 17. During her career, she has worked with many musicians, including Sting. She's also received a Grammy nomination. According to a CNN article, a Philadelphia man was caught using a cell phone jammer on a city bus. The man said he was so sick of hearing people talk loudly on their phones, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Though cell jammers are illegal in the U.S., some still argue their usefulness. We wanted your thoughts on where or when you would block cell phone reception. Well, when we have get-togethers for meetings and stuff, um, a lot of the people bring their cell phones along, so that would be a good place. When I'm uh, eating at a restaurant, I don't like to listen to people's conversations. I think probably either the movie theater, um, definitely, because you see a lot of texting. It always bugs me to see the level of disrespect people give the teacher when they're texting blatantly in class. I would probably jam it if it went off like in a concert or a movie show. I would definitely carry one on a date too because everyone hates it when you're on a date and your date's like, oh crap, or they don't even say anything. You're just like sitting in the car and there's like that awkward moment and you're like, I have to think of something to say. And then you look over, you think of something great to say and you look over and they're like, A comment from our Facebook page from Grand Forks, North Dakota. Jessica says, fast food lines, sometimes people are chatting on the phone so much they don't pay attention to the workers or the other customers in line. I would also use them in public restrooms. Jane says, I'm amazed that some people will pay good money to seek medical advice and they talk on the phone or text while in the exam room and not pay attention to the advice being offered. Most people play the role of viewer in regards to reality TV. We'll talk to a woman who became an extreme survivalist on a popular reality show. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by the Listen Center, where meeting friends at Listen is a groovy thing to do and has been since the days of Woodstock. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. 
This is a place where innovation abounds, a place where dreams come true, a place where creativity is a way of life, a place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. The stereotypical girly girl couldn't possibly be made into an extreme outdoor survivalist. The show MTV Made thrives on this formula of opposites. Molly Sandro spent her summer being made, and she's here to give us the reality behind reality TV. Thanks for coming you're on welcome. the show. Thanks for having me. Well, you're on the show. What made you want to do something like this? Well, they came to our high school, and me and my friend Taylor just were like, well, let's just try out for fun. How often does MTV Made come to your high school? So. We tried out and we, we picked something that was completely opposite of how we were. I mean, we have never really camped outside. I have a cabin that I go to. And so are you a girly girl? Yep. Yeah, I are. definitely am. I'm in a sorority now, and it's just always something that I've always loved, just makeup and clothes and stuff like that. So, What was the interview process like to get on the show? Well, they just like brought us into a room and they filmed us just having a conversation with one of like a producer from MTV and it was just like talking to a friend. They just asked about what we do for fun and then me and Taylor just started talking and then it's before we knew it, it was over. Okay. And, uh, and they say you're in. What next? <laughs> well, they came and um, did a weekend um, filming us to see if they wanted to do a full hour episode with us. And after that, then they just said, yes, you're in. We're going to do the episode. And they came down almost two weeks later, um, very quick process, and started filming right away. Okay, and they did a, a day in the life video, actually, of you. Was it accurate of your personality, or did they taint things a little bit? I mean, it was accurate. There were very much the things that me and my friend would normally do on a daily basis, me going over to her house and us just chit-chatting on her porch. But it was definitely planned. Like, we had to tell them where we're going, at what time, and, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to paint our nails, so you're going to film us doing that. So. And do you, why was it important for you to do this with your friend? I don't think I ever could have done this by myself, um, especially now going through it, seeing how hard it really was. Having that support system there was very important. And I think we were both just embarrassed and scared to have to have the possibility of being on TV alone. So. <laughs> okay. Now, there were other contestants that tried to get in the show. Mm -hmm. What were their ideas compared to yours? Was it all similar? Or? Um, there were a few people who wanted to be singers or... Um, pop stars and things like that. But there were a group of girls who wanted to be extreme survivalists, two girls exactly like us who wanted to do the same thing, and we were so nervous that they were gonna pick them instead of us, so we kind of twisted it a little bit and had some fun with it, and we kind of played it off as they heard us talking about what we wanted to do, and MTV just loved that there was some kind of drama in our lives. Sure, all right, well they take you then and plop you down in Alaska. What was yeah. that like being in the wilderness now, uh, getting filmed? and they're following you around. Yeah, it was very difficult at first. I mean, we only had 10 days of training before we were thrown into Alaska, and it was definitely scary. I was not sure what we were supposed to be doing, but it was very helpful, the people that we went with, they were all experts doing it, and they really just pushed us through. Well, pushing you, and, and this picture here <laughs> of you, you don't look too happy. No, me and my friend, we weren't the original kayak partners that they put us with, and. I, we, neither of us have ever kayaked, and especially in the Prince William in Alaska where there's waves and there's unpredictable raining and stuff, it was horribly hard, <laughs> and we were not good at it, and we were very upset the whole time. So did, they, did producers push you to this point where, uh, you know, you just couldn't take it anymore? Yeah, how they, bad did it get? They definitely poke you and poke you and poke you for, how are you feeling? Well, aren't you mad about that? Aren't you upset that that happened? So they definitely poke you for emotions, and they, they want you to get angry, and they want you to get upset because it makes good TV for How them. bad did it get for you? When What was the worst? Um, the worst for me was um, when we were actually backpacking, and I... I had horrible blisters and walking uphill with blisters and a 50 pound pack on is miserable and then you have the cameras there when you're almost in tears wanting you to talk to them and tell them how you're feeling and you're already feeling horrible and the last thing you want to do is talk about it to someone sure. on with, the camera. Well with cameras in your face, what was that like to constantly have people watching? I mean, at, in the first year is really hard, but by the end of it, I, you kind of become really close with the camera guys, and I became really close friends with them, and it turned out to be really fun. Okay. What's the weirdest thing you experienced when you were there? 
Um, the weirdest thing I experienced was probably when they had to film, they, it was raining one day so they couldn't film a little interview with me. And so then we had to wait until we got back to Anchorage, Alaska and we tried to find the woodiest area that we could and they filmed me there and pretended that we were hiking still in, in the middle of Alaska when we, we really were went back in time. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's great to get this look behind thank the reality TV. Me. All right, thanks, Molly. You're watching Studio One from the University of North Dakota. We'll be back right after this. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences is meeting the challenge of future healthcare workforce shortages. The state's only medical school produces the highest percentage of graduates nationwide who choose family medicine. Advanced degrees are also offered in basic medical sciences like anatomy and health professions like physical therapy. Students learn and train throughout the state. In that way, we really are North Dakota. Make your choice the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. If this tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. Tune in next week on Studio One. We'll talk to a decorated soldier about his tour in Iraq. Plus, we'll have other news and entertainment stories for you. We're going to leave you now with pictures of hundreds of volunteers filling bags with food for starving children. From all of us here at Studio One, have a great week. <laughs>